Hello everyone. Um, this next clip happens in a system called M2-C, F1, <laughs> in uh, the region of the syndicate. Uh, uh, before I uh, before I start, I'm going to talk a little bit about this location. Uh, this system is an entry into a uh, dead end pocket in syndicate. Uh, most often, I guess, referred to as the S-U pocket. This pocket has a bit of history. I think uh, a lot of alliances have started out here, including Goon Swarm and, and a few others. And um, it's a pretty big pocket. Has 17 systems. But the like, it's a point that I'm trying to make is that dead end pockets are something you have to be really careful of as a, a roaming gang if you're just running around with a few people, uh, because if the residents want and this sometimes happens, they can just sort of wait for you to do whatever, have everyone dock up, and then just wait for you on on, uh, on the exit to the pocket, since there's only one way in or out, which is the characteristic of pockets. Uh, you can, they can wait on the exit with a, just a camp that you really can't engage, um, and just sort of force you to do either dock up, log off, jump into them and die, or, or something else that I guess would be their intention. Um, so you have to be prepared to either have a fleet composition that can either, you know, run camps that's in the pocket or just be prepared that you have a prober or something that can, you know, maybe probe your your way out through a wormhole or something. If you do get caught in the 17 systems to work with, you could probably find one. But it's just something to be mindful of that if you do enter a pocket that has one system that, you know, leads in and the same system leads out, that it is possible you're going to be camped in and that you should be prepared for that possibility. Now, as far as where the fight actually happens, it's in M2, which is not in the pocket, but just, you know, outside it, leading into the pocket. Um, we were planning to go in and see what we could find, but uh, in the system leading in itself, there are what appears to be, um, I guess, from local, we could tell that there's sort of discussion back and forth between two groups of people, maybe some blues shooting each other by mistake. So immediately from this, we can tell that it's two separate gangs, and that uh, might lead to, you know, them being less organized ra if, rather than if it was one cohesive unit. So I guess that's, a, that's an advantage for us, even if there's like, uh, I don't know, 20 people that we have to deal with that effectively we might only have to be dealing with 10 at a time, so we, sh we should, uh, it's probably not as bad as it might seem. And there's also an incursion in the system, so that means that these guys might be running a site. Now usually people that are running incursions pretty well set up with logistics and and, and whatnot, and, and the warpins for the beacons uh, lead the gate and then just drop you in the same spot all the time, so it's, it would have been a bit more tricky if they were an incursion, but luckily for us they weren't in an incursion, and um, there's just two gangs I think maybe roaming around, and it appears that one of the gangs has uh, warped the gate, but before, before I talk about the actual fight, let me just back up a bit and talk about uh, our gang composition. What we're running is... Uh, uh, tornado, the Tengu with 100 MN afterburner, and two Drakes with, I guess, each one has dual webs, as well as uh, Loki links. Um, we're not really set up for anything, we're just sort of roaming, seeing what we can uh, uh, run into. And as far as the composition goes, it's a fairly well rounded format. You have the two Drakes with two webs for uh, sort of anti support, Tornado for projected DPS, Tengu. Uh, as well as the Drakes, uh, also project the DPS, and the Tengu can also help deal with um, anti-support. The Drake and Tengus are just generally all around good at both anti-support and damage projection uh, in, in general, so they just sort of fill both roles, um, whereas the Tornado is sort of more dedicated um, heavy damage uh, type ship. So that's what we have, uh, and the first group that we run into are uh, three Hurricanes, a Mermadon, and an Aga. And afterwards, more come in, but uh, I'll deal with this first group. So, as the fight starts, uh, we're finishing taking, well, as the FAP starts, we finish uh, taking down the Naga. Now, the Naga is um, the best primary in this case because it projects damage much better than the Hurricanes. The Myrmidon doesn't really project damage that well. And the Hurricanes, actually, actually one of the Hurricanes is pretty good uh, damage projection, it's arty, but usually we, we just go in assuming. Hurricanes are out of cannon fitted. But either way, um, they're just pretty much going to be hitting at similar range to the Naga, and the Naga 
has um, a much weaker tank than than uh, any of the hurricanes. So it's it's always a, as a good primary. It's a good damage projecting ship with not a lot of, a lot of uh, HP. So it, may, it makes sense to shoot it first. And um, as you can see, when the clip starts, that uh, they they primaried my tornado, and I, I take a lot of damage and. I'm actually in quite a bit of trouble with low shields and, and very little buffer, so I have to make range immediately. Um, and as the Naga goes down, the, the next uh, the next uh, thing we need to worry about are the artillery on the one of the hurricanes. One of the hurricanes appears to have artillery, so it's the next one that needs to be uh, focused. So uh, it gets called after, and at this point. Um, we're pretty far off the gate, so uh, you'll notice one of our one of our gang members calls that uh, calls aggression on certain ships. Calling aggression is important if they're sort of on the gate at zero, um, in a position to just leave if they want to, and then, you know calling aggression is good for knowing what to shoot. But when when targets are sort of you know not in a position to leave and, and they're being aggressive, it's uh, it's not as important to call aggression with the with the intention of uh, you know primarying ships that are aggressing you. So I that's just something to keep in mind. So at this point, uh, we just go for the hurricane, and we can see that there's a carries as well, who's uh, on grid. So uh, along with uh, shooting the primary hurricane and spreading points, this carry could also be a, a problem for us. Because what we're doing in our gang, we're all kiting, so we're close to the, uh, well, not in the case of the Tengu, but perhaps in the case of the Drakes, and, and certainly in the case of the Tornado, we're close to the edge of lock range. So if this carries just locks, us, locks three of us up, puts a damp on three of us, we're effectively completely disabled. And carries are actually really, really powerful in, in small, small gang engagements. So after this hurricane, um, I, I sort of inquire about the carries, if, if he's actually um, sort of, um, damping anyone because it's not happening to me. I'm able to walk fine, but uh, others aren't. And uh, I think our Tengu mistakes the damping of the carries. Maybe his overview is buggy for or something for incursion effects. <laughs> so um, I guess the carries actually was doing a job on the Tengu and sort of keeping it damp, but uh, it was mistaken for something else. So we just sort of ignored it longer than we should have, and um, doesn't really have a huge impact because uh, we were able to take care of it later but it's it's something worth noting so after this hurricane goes down uh, we're thinking about going for the Myrmidon but it, it's not able to project damage and it's not really anything we need to worry about too much it's sort of more of kind of like a pylon it's just as long as we're aware of it and we, we don't go too close to it we can just sort of keep it there and, and worry about things that are much more fat much faster and more mobile and, and can pose uh, a larger threat. And indeed there are a uh, saber as the carries the left grid. There's a saber and hurricane who are warping in or burning burning towards us. So we're shooting the Myrmidon for a bit but decided we need to switch to the saber. Since the saber is burning directly at us so we're able to track well I'm at least able to track him really, really well and he's burning straight into the HMLs of the uh, uh, Tengu and Drake. So he, he dies really quickly. Next we're going for um, the closest hurricane to us, and another hurricane is uh, sort of come on grid further away, and there's only three of them on grid right now. Remember, on sort of like more or less an immovable target, we're, we're doing fine killing this guy. So I'm sort of moving uh, moving away. Uh, I didn't check scan, which I, I should have done, so that that was a mistake. I didn't see the scan coming in, but what I was trying to do is just sort of spread tackle and make sure we can um, basically finish everything that we could. Um, not suspecting that there was uh, second, the second group from, I guess, maybe the second alliance had come in to support their blues. So the hurricane goes down. Since we separated to sort of um, split tackle and everything, we're out of position again. You can see there's a drake that's really close to them, and um, he gets caught. The first thing that needs to, well, he, he gets neutered, and, and since we're all you know, not running cat boosters except for the Tengu, it, it's really bad for him because he's pretty much you know dead in the water. He can't do anything. Even if we can kill a curse in time, he still has no cap to burn, which is why in some cases a curse is, is scarier than than a rapier, for example, because you know after it dies you can you know you can burn. The webs are no longer on you, but you know when you're neutered, 
you have to regenerate that cat before you can cycle your micro warp drive. So he's unfortunately in a bad position and gets neutered by the curse, so he's more or less dead in the water. Um, the rest of us are trying to, after you know, moving out of position to sp sort of spread tackle, we're trying to reposition ourselves uh, on top of uh, someone who you know is in a good position. Uh, I call Green Yoshi and the Drake, um, since he's sort of in between uh, us and sort of a good uh, person to converge on. But uh, perhaps uh, Brutus and his Tengu might have been a better choice because you know in his inability to sort of really turn as well, and it seems he's also being primaried along with uh, Dio Midas and his Drake. So Dio Midas is being shot. We know we need to, you know, get this curse off the grid, even though there's a lot of other targets that are um, fairly um, dangerous to us as well. But the curse is the most dangerous because once we lose our ability to position ourselves, then it's pretty much game over for us, and there's not um, a whole lot we can do. Uh, is they have more damage on the field than us. They outnumber us, and we're just pretty much in trouble if we get mooted. So we're trying to kill the curse. Um, at the same time, it's sort of hesitant for us to sort of primary this curse because he is the only one close to it. And although the rest of us are sort of in range to, we're, we're pretty much in decent range to do damage, but no one has a point. So this curse can just leave at any time, and we're, we're effectively, although forcing it off is pretty decent, we're not killing it, and perhaps we might be able to kill something else. So it's always important to. If, when you can, try to shoot targets that are dangerous to you, that you're in a position to, you know, finish off, that you have pointed and tackled and stuff. So this cur Kirsch leaves, we're, we're wanting to switch off to it, but we're hesitant because he's so low, we're hoping maybe he just, you know, doesn't warp in time, but our damage isn't really um, happening that fast, and we're not doing a ton of DPS at the range we're at, so he, he can react, he has time to react and um, warp out. Our Drake goes down at this point, our second Drake is being pressured, but he's not pointed um, for whatever reason. Maybe he's too far, but it looks like he's fairly close to be pointed, so I'm not sure. Uh, anyway, he's able to warp out. He's in low shield. I can tell on watch list, which is another important reason to have watch list. You can uh, always um, know what's, what the status of your gang members are and you know inquire and see if they need help and what you can do to help them if they do. Anyway, he warps off. He's able to warp off and come back. Uh, we go want to try to primary a Vagabond. Um, it's closest to me from where I am, but uh, after zooming out I realize that it's really not that good of a call because um, the positioning of their ships has the their Tornado which will die much faster than the, than the Vaga um, in a closer position to our, our Tengu and it's easier for the Tengu to you know get proper tackle on whereas the Vaga can sort of just fly away if, if he's, if he's um, smart. Again, this is the uh, importance of, I guess, zooming out in the fight, being aware of positioning. It really helps. So as well as the tactical overlay, it really helps. You um, have an awareness of where you are, where your gangmates are, and, and where the hostiles are, and it helps you make those decisions much more effectively. Um, after this tornado, there's a, there's a closest target to Zealot. We're best able to project damage on it. But then this carries has come back, and it's, it's damping our Tengu down, and it's reducing its effectiveness. It's really close, but it, it's having trouble walking. So it needs to go. I'm the only one that can really get rid of it because our, our Tengu's down, so it's sort of, an, or sort of a bad uh, situation, but I'm able to get some, reduce the transversal on, on the carries and, and kill him in a, in a couple volleys. So carries is gone. Um, Brutus can, in it seems, his Tengu can walk again. And we're going for the Zealot because he was the closest, but that's quickly changed because the Vagabond's burning. So we're going to go for the Vagabond, but again, that changes again. You really have to be prepared to, like, you know, make these quick changes, because as the situation changes, what you need to, you know, prioritize is going to change as well. So this Stiletto has come in as well, uh, in, instead of is fast coming in faster than this Vagabond. The Vagabond's only, like, in the set 60% shield, so Stiletto needs to be prioritized. Again, I try to get good transversal to hit it. Um, I don't track very well, but if I can get far enough away and, and um, reduce his transversal as much as possible, then I'll, I'll be able to hit it. He's webbed as well, so that... That helps me. Um, our um, Drake comes back at range. Uh, when you don't have bounces on a gate, it's not somewhere you you know you usually fight at a lot. It's always good to come back at max range because in a fight like this, when you're burning, uh, you know, a good weapon at one point it might become terrible later on. So it's always good to um, go back at, at range, and then you know it's less likely you'll be in the middle of all the hostiles. Um,
from here on, uh, there's, there's a tornado sort of close. You'll notice I'm not running my in ball. The reason I'm doing that is because of most of the cap, and I'm not being primary. I don't need to run my tank mod, which I guess is the in ball helping me tank a little bit better. So there's really no reason for me to run it, and it'll help me, you know, maintain uh, cap to burn. So if you're not being shot, you really don't need to run it. But anyway, um, we go for the tornado. And uh, we try to regroup on each other again, uh, finish them all. After the tornado, I guess the, the, this curse is back that we, we let go the first time. And he needs to die immediately after. Uh, I guess he's the closest, but he can also really mess up our cap. So um, we, we, we kill him after uh, finishing off the tornado. And at this point, it seems like they're, they've lost quite a bit. And they're in the position that it we think they're probably going to start um, bailing. So um, we start spreading points. We can only really spread points on the curse and the zealot. Zealots pointed. The rest of them are too far. But as we shoot the zealot, um, we're, we're getting ready to position ourselves to spread points on, on the rest of them. Uh, notice I'm, I'm being shot. And so I'm, I'm right now more concerned about moving away. Because even I do, though I do a lot of damage, I'm actually really weak. I turn my in ball back on. And and move away while shooting the sell it. Um, next closest thing, Cinnabar, but it, it's come in and it's warped off. And we start to burn back in closer to the guys who aren't as fast as the ships that we killed and try to, try to get points on them. But uh, we're actually too far away and uh, they've uh, more or less warped off except for people who are warping back. So now this comes back to, you know, lack of organization and maybe um, communication wasn't as good and, you know, telling people, or maybe this guy didn't even ask whether he could come back or not, but um, people coming back in after the fight's over thinking it's not over, and it's more or less us just ganking these, these last few ships. So here's, the fight ends more or less here. Um, lots of things, I guess, uh, we can talk about where positioning was really important, um, communicating our, our situation, uh, being told that the carries hasn't damped, has the Thousand Art Tango Dent and needs to, needs to be dealt with. Um, maintaining range, um, cap management, all sorts of little things that um, can be sort of taken away from this fight. Worth noting is that at the start of the fight, you could see sort of the, the purple boxes representing our, our, uh, our fleet sort of separated, but as, as uh, sort of the fight kicks off and, and if, if a little bit has passed, we're just sort of regrouping together and sort of moving away from the, the bulk of them with each other. And then that's really important, the, this positioning that we're doing, because it ensures that we're able to cover each other in case something happens, and that we can support each other, as, as opposed to if we were, yeah, all at the proper range away from the primary, but completely far away from each other, like so we're each 40k or 30k from who we're shooting, but we're on the opposite side, so we're 70, 60-70k from each other, and that could be really bad if one of us gets caught. The rest of us are, aren't in any position whatsoever to support that other person. So it's really important to keep in mind in um, uh, fights like this to try to stay close to your gangmates and, and not get separated. But in the end, it's pretty successful for us. We lose one Drake, and we kill a Velvet Curse, a couple Hurricanes, and I got a couple Tornadoes, a Carries, Navy, Omen, a Saber, and a Stiletto. It's pretty decent for being as outnumbered as we were, and us just being able to um, sort of tie around them and uh, manipulate them into you know, pulling apart from each other and making the fight more manageable for us.